Hello and welcome to Stolen From Me. I'm Lindsay and with every episode we look into, viewer discretion is advised. Please don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell. It really helps my channel out. Thank you all so much and let's just get started. Today we're looking into the case of Alice Gross. Alice Poppy Madeline Gross lived in Hanwell in West London. She was born on the 14th of February 2000. She had an older sister called Nina and her mother, Rosalind, and her father was Jose. Alice was described as a loving, loyal, quirky girl with a lively sense of comedy and a compassionate nature. She was a keen musician, not only could she play and write her own music, but she could sing too. Alice played the violin and the piano and she could turn her hand at nearly any musical instrument. She was learning to play the guitar and hoped eventually one day to make a career out of it. Alice loved photography and fashion too. From the age of 11, she had planned what she was going to wear to her prom and actually designed her own prom dress. On the 28th of August 2014, around 1pm, 14-year-old Alice headed out of the door of her family home in Hanworth in West London. She told her mum she would be home by 6 o'clock. Alice often went for a walk along the Grand Union Canal. This wasn't anything out of the ordinary. She had walked this route a hundred times before. Alice texted her dad just before half past four, saying that she'll be home in a minute and she's on her way home. But six o'clock came and went. Alice wasn't home. Seven o'clock came. Alice's parents became concerned as Alice still wasn't home and it wasn't like Alice to just not turn up for any reason. She was always home on time. Rosalind and Jose called the police and reported Alice missing. At first, Alice's parents became concerned Alice might have gone missing due to her mental health. She was currently battling anorexia and depression, but Alice was seeking treatment for this. The police began an investigation and launched a missing person search. Alice was a vulnerable young girl and they didn't know if something had happened to her or if she wanted to disappear herself. Detective Carl Meta was put in charge of Alice's case. Alice's friends and family began searching for her. With word spreading fast, the community of Hanwell and surrounding areas tied yellow ribbons around the school that Alice attended and all over Ealing. Missing persons posters was put up all over West London. CCTV footage captured Alice walking along the Grand Union Canal towpath around 3.45pm. She was spotted on camera at Brentford Lock safe of where she lives. Alice was seen again walking along the Grand Union Canal under Trumper's Way at the bridge crossing the canal, heading towards home around 4.26pm. This is where she texted her dad to say that she wouldn't be long. Alice had a backpack on, which was like a purpley black colour and splashes of colour all over it, blues, purples and pinks across it. The Metropolitan Police had spoken to friends and carried out house-to-house -house inquiries, searching parks and open spaces in efforts to find Alice. Detective Carl Meta would move the investigation to a major inquiry now. This would lead to the largest police search involving 600 officers from eight different forces. And this would turn into one of the biggest searches since 7-7 London bombings. The police and divers would end up searching nine square miles, 23 kilometres of wooded area and also three and a half square miles, which is nine kilometres of water. On the 1st of September, Alice's parents appealed for Alice to come home, making sure she knew she was not in trouble at all and she was extremely loved and missed. The river was so thick with mud that every time the divers moved inside the water, it would cloud over so thick it would obstruct their vision, leaving the divers to solely rely on their touch and feel along the way to find any information they could. Alice had been missing for a week, with no sighting of her. The family made another appeal for Alice to come home, or if anyone knew where she was to get in touch. At this point in the investigation, 
Family and police were unsure of Alice's safety. They weren't sure if she could have caused harm to herself in any way or if someone had caused harm to her. Nothing was being ruled out at this point. On the 4th of September, the police released the CCTV footage of Alice being seen walking along the Grand Union Canal for the last time. Within a day or so, the police discovered Alice's rucksack along the bank of the River Brent. Alice's parents identified the rucksack as belonging to Alice. Inside the rucksack, among Alice's belongings, were her blue van plimsolls she was wearing the day she went missing. Alice's mobile phone was missing. The police used cell site analysis to place Alice's phone signal along the River Brent, where she had texted her dad on the way home. Detective Carl Metter decided the divers should search the river again, but this time he wanted to find Alice's phone. Carl Metter wanted the divers to cover three miles or four kilometres of river. Ten days into the investigation, Detective Carl Metter no longer thought Alice had taken her own life. They believed that if she had gone into the water voluntarily, she would have come up to the surface by now. The police had a tip-off that a man had certain items in his car that could have belonged to someone who hurt Alice. Such things as spades, sacks and things like that. The police arrested this man due to him refusing to say what the tools were for. And this actually led to another man being arrested for murder. But the two were separate and not connected to each other. However, both men was later released without any charges brought against them. Two weeks into the investigation, the police searched the missing persons list and they found a few days after Alice went missing, on the 4th of September, Arnus Zelkins, a 41-year-old builder, was reported missing by his partner. He'd left for work that morning but never came home. It was later discovered that Zelkins was also on the same bridge at the River Brent where Alice was walking the day she went missing. He too was seen on CCTV. It's believed that Zelkins was roughly 15 minutes behind Alice, although he was on his bicycle and Alice was on foot, but he was headed in the same direction as Alice was walking on the way home and he was on his way home from work. He could have passed Alice easily being on a bike. Zelkins was then seen again on CCTV leaving the towpath around 45 minutes later. This raised concerns with the police as being on a bike this would have never taken Zelkins this long to reach the end of the towpath. The police was now starting to take a little bit more interest in Zelkins. He was seen again on CCTV from a shop buying a few beers. This was just after Alice went missing. Police noticed that his trousers was rolled up. Now, this could be because he was riding a bike, of course, but then again, it could be something much worse. 9.30 the same evening, Zelkins was seen riding along the same towpath. He would then again be seen around an hour later leaving the towpath on CCTV. But this time, he had changed his clothes. Then, the following morning, he was seen again in the same area where he had spent a considerable amount of time. Police believed Arna Selkins was now a person of interest. At this point, the police decided to search Selkins' address, and they even dug up his garden, attempted to find anything that would link him to Alice. On the 16th of September, Detective Carl Metter publicly named Arna Selkins a person of interest. They also appealed to anyone who had any information on Zelkin's whereabouts to come forward. There was no obvious link that Alice would have known Zelkin's in any way. Police were keen to speak to Zelkin's about this case. The day Alice was seen on the towpath, Zelkin's was riding his bike. There was four other people seen on CCTV, biking along the same path. The police asked all five to come forward. It's believed that four out of the five cyclists came forward. Zulkins was the only one not to do so. On the 25th of September, four weeks after Alice disappeared, the family appealed again for help. 
they recreated Alice's last steps with an actor walking along the River Brent. Alice had a distinctive walk. She would walk as in like a power walk, swinging her arms back and forth. By recreating this, they were hoping someone would come forward with any information if they saw Alice on the bridge. The police were looking into who Anna Salkins was. He was originally from Latvia, and the police found out he was a convicted murderer. He had been sentenced to prison in Latvia. Zulkins lured his wife into the woods near where they lived. He then brutally bludgeoned her over the head and then stabbed his own wife. He placed her body in a shallow grave that he had previously dug himself. He then drank a bottle of vodka over her grave. However, it's believed that when he was arrested, he did take the police to where his wife's body was. I suppose that's one thing for her mother, so she can lay to rest. But still. Zulkins was sentenced to eight years, even though the prosecution tried to get 12. He would only serve six years for killing his wife. Zulkins never showed any remorse whatsoever. I think the minimum sentence in Latvia for murder is five years and then the maximum is 15 years. But Zulkins served six. When Zulkins lived with his partner, I don't know if it's the same partner who came to the UK with him, but when they lived in Latvia, people would actually come up to her and tell her that she was dating a convicted killer and he had murdered his own wife. Zulkins obviously didn't take too kindly to this and he moved to another part of Latvia. This was just for a short while though. But then he would move again, not long, I think that was in 2007, and this would be where he came to the UK. But the question everybody was asking, how was a convicted killer able to come into the UK without any checks whatsoever, just allowed into the country? The police were keen to find Zelkins, and they wanted to find him fast. He was nowhere to be found in Ealing. Nobody could find him whatsoever, so the police decided to go to Latvia to see if they could find him there. They expanded their search across Europe and in Zulkin's native country. Detectives believed that Zulkin was the man responsible for Alice but he had not been seen since the 4th of September. The 30th of September, divers came across a large pile of thick logs in the water. These logs were placed on top of a bicycle wheel. The wheel had four bricks attached to it. and This was attached to a bin bag or garbage bag. This is where they discovered Alice's badly decomposed body. She was wrapped in plastic bin bags. Alice was naked, apart from a sock on her foot, and she was tied in a fetal position inside the bin bags. The logs, wheel, bricks, plus bags were all holding Alice's body down so she wouldn't float to the surface and be discovered. Whoever did this had taken a large amount of time to conceal Alice's body. The cause of death was mechanical asphyxiation, like a heavy weight laying on top of her body until she was unable to breathe any more. Alice was just 40 kilograms, six stone. She was a tiny young girl. Alice's family was informed her body had been found. On the 1st of October, Alice's body was formally identified. The police was now looking for a murderer. The police launched a murder investigation. Zulkins was the prime suspect. The police had forensic evidence now. Alice's shoes that was in a rucksack had DNA on them, as well as a cigarette butt that was found near the crime scene. And the DNA was that of Anna Zulkins. But this wasn't enough. They needed more to go on. This just proved that he had touched Alice's shoes and smoked a cigarette near where her body was discovered. There was also the CCTV placing him in the area at the same time as Alice. And then obviously they shew that he had returned several times. 
At Zulkan's home, where they dug up his garden, they discovered Alice's mobile phone cover, and this was hidden in his back garden under his patio. Alice's sister, Nina, formally identified it as being Alice's phone cover. On the 4th of October, the police made another discovery. Four days after Alice's body was found, the police were searching Boston Manor Park. Arna Sulkins was found dead. He had hung himself from a tree. He had gone deep into the park and his body was hidden by trees and bushes and overgrowth. Even though his body was decomposing, the police formally identified him. At an inquest, it is said that Zulkins had taken his own life. It was also said in the inquest that there was an overwhelming amount of evidence and that if Zulkins was alive, he would have been charged for Alice's murder. Evidence found. Alice's shoes, her mobile phone case, the cigarette butt, the bin bags, the CCTV placing them at the crime scene. Plus, he had previous convictions. The inquest said that he would have been charged for killing Alice. It's believed that Sulkins had hid Alice's body amongst the trees and then he went back to the crime scene and wrapped her up and placed her in the water. Sadly, Alice's family never saw justice for Alice's murder. The jury of eight men and three women announced in their final conclusions on the sixth day of the inquest held at the Royal Courts of Justice in London that Alice's death was consistent with compression asphyxiation. They believed that she was murdered in a sexually motivated act. Alice was found naked, but there was no evidence to say that she had been sexually assaulted. Zulkins came to the UK in 2007, unchecked. Even though he had a series of previous convictions before he had even entered the UK, including firearms, sexual assault, and not forgetting the murder of his own wife. He was also arrested in the UK in 2009 on suspicion of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl just two miles away from where Alice's body was killed. The case was dropped after the alleged victim refused to make a statement. On the 2nd of November, hundreds of people attended the memorial service for Alice in Greenford in West London. It is now policy to check people. It is believed that 80% of foreign suspects are now checked whether they are coming into the UK or we are leaving the UK. Alice's family called for a careful, targeted reform of the system, exchanging information for high-risk offenders across Europe. In a statement after the verdict, her parents said, like Alice, our family is in favour of freedom of movement and all good things that has brought into our lives. We do not believe that any citizen deserves to be treated differently based on the race or nationality. Our only concern has been to ensure that there are fair and proportionate rules governing the movements of serious criminals within Europe, whether that is a Latvian coming into the UK or a dangerous citizen travelling abroad. Alice's father spoke outside the court. As Alice's father, losing Alice has shattered me. The pain of knowing I will never see her or cuddle her again is unbearable. This inquest has helped me face what has happened and hopefully now I will be able to properly grieve for my beautiful loving daughter. Alice's mother said, I still find it almost impossible to believe that our lovely daughter has been so brutally taken from us. I miss her every moment of every day. I have felt the need to find out as much as I can about how it is possible that she had been killed in such a horrific way and to try to change things so that it never happens to anybody else. Alice's sister, Nina, said, I feel that it is sometimes forgotten that Alice was a real person, a kind and loving sister who deserved so much to live a full life. Life is broken and cold without her, regardless of whether the legal responsibility can be attributed to the state of Alice's death. 
I believe the state failed Alice and our family. Alice was not tragic, but what happened to her was. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode. I hope you're all safe and well, and I will see you all again soon. Much love, Lindsay.